Okay, so in, in line with the theme on climate change, a lot of people here are talking about how the reef organism is going to respond to climate change. I think for a moment I'm going to talk about how we can look at differences in the environmental drivers of climate change and how they manifest themselves at different scale, particularly temperature climatology and thermal stress in nearshore versus offshore environments. So the background is um, some, probably something very familiar to everyone here is that there's a natural variability in temperature in most environments and then when you superimpose that variability on rising ocean warming trends that eventually that variability will exceed kind of some sort of um, threshold for bleaching. And that's something that an idea that Ove put uh, forth a, a while ago. And then they've kind of updated this kind of analysis by looking at the output from global circulation models. And depending on the GCM that you run in the climate forcing scenario, you can get different outcomes in terms of what the future of coral bleaching would be. So the general consensus is that around um, uh, half of the reefs um, by mid-century will be bleaching on an annual basis. And that's a pretty dark prediction but those are the predictions they're still revising and working on. So in terms of monitoring uh, temperature and, <clears throat> and thermal stress in real time, you can get a lot of products from, derived from satellite um, SST um, composite data sets. And this is something, a very popular data set from a Coral Reef Watch. It's uh, SST anomalies at 50 kilometer resolution. And then it gives you a very good overview of what's going on in the ocean and also in um, different parts of the globe. And this particular slice is from February of 2011. It's a time when, uh, along the WA coastline, we were actually having an anomalous uh, warm period that people often refer to as a heat wave. You can see it down here. And so with these same products, you can actually zoom into the region of interest. So if you're working in WA, you're interested in the WA coastline, maybe south, north, Ningaloo, maybe parts of the Pilbara. Um, but there's a limit to kind of the resolution that you can look at. So the question really you want to get to is what does the warming look like on the scale of an individual coral or algae or reef community? And so that's a bit of an uh, open question and changes on various conditions. So like I said, you start off with kind of reef scale warming events and these are driven by larger scale atmospheric and oceanic um, dynamics, things like El Nino, La Nina and other phenomena. But then to get to the scale of an individual reef system, you have to drop down roughly in order of magnitude to go from hundreds of kilometers to tens of kilometers. But then to look at an individual reef system, you have to drop, drop down another order of magnitude to go from tens of kilometers to kilometers. And then often you're looking at changes between offshore of the reef and inshore on the reef in the shallow sections are on the order of 100 meters. So you have to drop down yet another order of magnitude. So the question is when you go through this downscaling process physically, what is happening to the kind of changes in water quality? Two things of general interest are water chemistry, carbonate chemistry, PCO2 saturation state, but also temperature. So at this scale, what you can actually do is put out temperature loggers and just make direct observations with, with how the temperature is changing at the reef itself on the scale of the reef itself. And the only difficulty is that you, it's only available for when you actually deploy the loggers at the site that you deploy your temperature loggers. And so usually what happens is you can deploy these loggers, and this is an example I took from Coral Bay on the Ingler Reef on the west coast, and you can deploy them at different sites within your reef system, and you'll notice that over time that you can often get, you know, one to two or three degree differences in temperature between what's going on offshore as predicted by even a high resolution uh, satellite data set and what's going on in the reef. And the other difficulty that you face is that a lot of times you're doing this in response to some sort of bleaching event. That is, you're sitting in your office in Perth, and suddenly someone's saying there's a big warming event, the coral are bleaching everywhere. And the next thing you know, you're calling your mate up at Coral Bay saying, we've got to put some temperature loggers in the water, stuff's happening. So the question is, when you do it this way, if you're doing it in response to an event in a particular reef system, you may have a good idea what the temperature is after the event, but what you really want to know is the temperature variability leading up to the event. And so you would like to rely on just some of this offshore um, satellite or sea surface temperature data, but the problem is reconstructing within the reef you notice that there are all these differences happening. So this is the temperature within the reef and this is the difference in temperature. And so to understand that um, and to get at that issue, you kind of have to understand the, um, how local variations in temperature occur and how they deviate from what the offshore temperatures are. And so you, it's basically a balance between circulation and the net um, flux of heat from the atmosphere into the reef waters. And so that's a balance between the flow here and the flux here. So what happens is you have water moving across a shallow reef, there's a net flux of heat into the water, and as it moves downstream, the temperature increases. Now what can happen 
is that for larger heat fluxes, if you go across the same difference and for the same level of circulation, you're going to get a stronger e increase in temperature. But if we go back to the same scenario, you can accomplish the same thing by just simply slowing down the circulation. So this little equation up here is basically showing you that the change in temper temperature over a fixed difference is a function between the ratio of the net atmospheric heat flux to the total transport in the water column. And so what's driving the circulation? Well, in a large portion of reef environments, it's actually waves doing. The waves that come, they shoal, they break. They elevate the sea surface level at the reef crest, and that drives circulation across the reef into the lagoon and out the channels. But there are also many reef systems that are tide dominant as well. And my colleague Ryan Lowe is going to be talking a little bit more about that right after me. But this is, for many reefs, you have a general pattern of wave circulation. So, what that means is the change in temperature within the nearshore reef environment, it's going to be related to the net atmospheric heat flux divided by the wave-driven transport. And of course, the wave-driven transport is a function of the offshore wave height and to a lesser extent, the offshore wave period. So you can say that the change in temperature to a given site as a function of time is a function of the ratio of the heat exchange divided by the wave-driven transport. So the question is, I'm mentioning here you have the net heat flux, but what is the net heat flux a function of? Well, it's a function of four fundamental terms, um, sources of and losses of heat. You have light, which brings the heat into the water in the first place. But then you, importantly, you have heat loss from evaporation and heat loss from the net radiation of infrared uh, uh, light, which we call long wave radiation. And then finally, there's something called sensible heat flux, which is just convection of heat in the air and the water molecules themselves. And that tends not to be that important. But the important thing to keep in mind is that what matters in terms of local heating of reef waters is the net heat flux. So you've got the influx of heat from light and the loss of heat from evaporation and infrared radiation. So what does that look like? Uh, here's seasonal changes in each of those heat flux terms. You can obviously see there's a seasonal variation in the input term, light, which makes sense. But the dominant cooling terms, which is the latent heat flux, evaporation, and long wave radiation don't really show any seasonal coherency. And also from the cooling terms, evaporation is the most important, followed by infrared uh, emissions. But then you'll notice the sensibly heat flux is very small, and it goes both ways. So we don't really get excited about sensible heat fluxes, but we do include them in the calculations. So what drives the cooling of reef water? So what I really wanted to emphasize is it's not just the light input, but it's actually the loss of heat, which is really important, because it's the net heat flux. So in terms of the cooling of reef waters, the two dominant terms are relative humidity. And humidity is important because it controls how much moisture the air mass can absorb. So at 100% humidity or saturation, an air mass can't absorb any more moisture. That means you can't have any latent heat losses due to evaporation. Also, wind speed is important, not as dominant as relative humidity. And wind speed, what that does is it changes the kind of convection velocity of both of water vapor and actually air in the boundary layer adjacent to the ERC interface. But it's not as important as relative humidity. It also helps with sensibly heat fluxes, but again, those are small, so we don't really get too concerned about it. What's interesting is the thing that doesn't matter really is air temperature. So you can get you know, very large changes in air temperature at Ningaloo, we can see on the order of 10 degrees, but it doesn't seem to really create any um, seasonal pattern in cooling, as you saw from the previous plot. So once you have this, you can go back and you can use your direct observations to maybe try to reconstruct what the temperature variability was before or leading up to this bleaching event. Oops, sorry. And one of the ways that you can do this is you can actually take some of these heat flux models and actually incorporate it into a fully 3D circulation model. So you have a numerical model of wave-driven circulation in your reef, and then you put in the climate forcing factors that control the net exchange of heat flow, and then you can actually look at changes in, in temperature. And then this is something that we've done in, uh, during this kind of uh, early 2011 heat wave in WA. And so this is something, this is a product of some simulations that Junlin Zhang has done. And if you just focus on the left, that tells you what the evolution of the thermal stress inside Coral Bay was during this period leading up to this uh, coral bleaching event. And the one of the simulation on the right would be as if that marine heat wave had happened a couple months later. Normally, you have temperature maximum in Ningaloo in April because of the dynamics between wind stress and the strength of the lunar current. And if it had happened later, you would have a much less um, heat stress because you would have had less net atmospheric heating and probably a little bit stronger wave circulation. But there is a difficulty with um, doing numerical models. One, you have to have both the temperature data to validate it, plus you have to have wave and 
current data to actually validate the hydrodynamic model. Now, that doesn't have to be done at the same time you're interested in <coughs> modeling the temperature dynamics, but you have to do it at some point. And they are a little bit cumbersome um, to develop and test and validate. And then it becomes difficult to run these simulations over very long periods of time, say several months or a year. So sometimes you're interested in the evolution of thermal stress over longer periods of time, over many years. So if you don't have a, a hydrodynamic model or it's too difficult for you to develop one, you can do a little bit of, of applying a semi-empirical model where you just take the basic forcing function, the dependency of changes in temperature on wave and atmospheric forcing, and put into a simple model where you relate the temperature of the reef to the temperature offshore plus some sort of difference. And that difference is proportional to the ratio of the net atmospheric heat flux divided by the offshore wave force. So in this kind of scenario, all you really need are some cheap temperature loggers, and you throw them out all over your reef system. And then you use some offshore SST data, hopefully at high resolution, less than 10 kilometers. You get some um, wave input, offshore wave heights and periods from a regional wave model. You use um, atmospheric forcing from a global climate reanalysis data set. And then you have no circulation model. So this is much more of a straight kind of semi-empirical way to get at the data of interest. And so if you do this just with the data you've collected at each of these sites, you find there's a very strong correlation between the change in temperature and this um, combined atmospheric wave forcing parameter. And the, the percent of the variance you, can, variance you can explain ranges from about 30% to 70%, depending on where you are on the reef. You can explain more variance in the parts of the near shore parts of the reef system that experience the largest degrees of temperature fluctuations. And then what you can do is you can take this data set and you can hindcast it and compare it against your observations. So in this case, I've got three lines, a red, a black, and a blue. The blue line is the offshore temperature. The black line is the observed temperature, and the red line is the model temperature. And so you can see that, in general, the red line, the model data, tends to follow the observed data. And this is just using that simple model. Once you've done that, what you can do is you can take all of that climate and offshore wave forcing and the temperature data from your composite satellite data set, and you can actually hindcast what the temperature was doing before the bleaching vent, before you had observations. And this is sort of what we had found, is that the blue line represents accumulation of thermal stress and degree uh, Celsius or degree heating weeks um, over that period. And you can see that in the ocean offshore, it peaked at about 12 degree heating weeks sometime in mid-April. But according to our model, depending where you are on the reef, it peaked anywhere between 16 and 22 degrees inside Coral Bay. But there's one other catch to doing this kind of uh, analysis is that no matter how you model the data, they will never reproduce 100% of the variability. And most modern methods or algorithms for assessing thermal stress are based on an integrated temperature variability. So if you're not capturing all the variability, you're not capturing the volatility and temperature that the reef is actually seeing. But what you can do is you can go over periods where you can compare both your modeled thermal stress and your observed thermal stress. And what you find is there's a fairly good linear relationship between the two. And you'll see that, in general, at least further ensure you get the more that your modeled thermal stress is less than your observed thermal stress. So what you can do is you can actually correct for what your model is doing to compensate for the variance loss. This is similar to some of what authors have been doing to analyzing a GCM model output. They noticed that the estimated seasonal variance in temperature was lower than observed. So what they did is they amplified that uh, frequency component so they get more realistic predictions of future bleaching events. And so the end result of that is you see that when you compensate for the variance loss of the model, you can get um, maximum thermal stresses inside, which range between 18 and 34 degree heating weeks. And so that's given what the, the thresholds for offshore um, bleaching at four degrees and eight degree heating weeks for bleaching and mortality, these levels are pretty, sh pretty high and they reflect the kind of uh, variability in both temperature and thermal stress that you get in inshore reef environments. And I think one of the more Interesting things about this study is that after this massive bleaching event, after the thermal stress had reached these really high values, most of the coral had re to recovered their pigmentation um, in about May or June. And so there were still some um, corals which had uh, patchy areas of coral that had died. Now, I'm, I'm saying this anecdotally, but people have um, taken some measurements um, through deep pond syrup. But most of that was inshore. So that's just a little bit of an interesting twist. So. Well, if I could leave you with one concluding comment, it's that the inshore is not always equal to the offshore. So you need to be careful of using offshore SST data to describe the kind of temperature climatology inshore. And a lot of times these local heating effects are, are important, and particularly they're important during regional heat waves, because what happens is you'll have a regional ocean warming event, 
it'll push the temperature above some sort of threshold or closer above it, then any additional marginal heating, one, two, or three degrees Celsius you get from weakened circulation or increased atmospheric heat fluxes actually makes the problem much worse. And finally, the change in temperature is a function of circulation, net heat fluxes and location. Circulation is a function of wave tides and geomorphology. Ryan Lowe is going to be talking a little bit more about that in a second. And then the net atmospheric heat flux is a function of light, humidity, and wind speed. Those are the dominant environmental forcing variables. So those are the people I've worked with. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>